Hey guys, you get another one of my video blogs. I think they're called vlogs, which makes me feel super hip and cool, even though I know I'm not. <laughs> um, oh, what a weekend. Well, actually, it started Thursday. A lot of deep thoughts. Um, my second, my number two, she graduated from high school on Thursday. I'm so proud of my baby. Um, but something interesting happened, and, and I don't know if I just have interesting things that happen in my life, or maybe I'm just paying attention um, to see these things happening. So, um, I went to use the restroom. Um, oh my gosh, I got there so early. I got so, so excited about being able to see my daughter, because she was graduating number two in her class of about 500, so proud, proud mama moment. But um, I wanted to make sure I was there early so that I could get a good seat so that we could see her. And then also my in-laws were in town and my mother-in-law just had like, you know, both of her knees replaced and my father-in-law, you know, he had, um, he was stage four, um, what was it, lymphoma? Yeah. Um, but he's, I mean, he's in remission now, but like he's much weaker than he used to be. So I want to make sure that I got good seats. And so I got there early and, um, oh, I just saw my neighbor drive by. Um, I got there early and, um, waited for like two hours, but I had this big old thing of, of water. And so, oh my gosh, I needed to pee, um, <laughs> so bad. So my full whole family, they eventually come after, like they let me in the gates, I get my seat and then, um, and then I'm like, okay, I need to go to the bathroom and I get in the bathroom and there's this girl and she's in her, um, you know, her, her full graduation dress and, um, she's sobbing. She's sobbing in the, um, the stall of the bathroom. Um, there's another person there, um, trying to talk to her. And, um, I hear that her family didn't show up for her graduation and she was just so heartbroken that there was no one there to support her. And, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, all the people in the bathroom, like we would support her, but you know, it's, it's not, it's just not the same as having your family. Right. And so, um, I went out, I found a teacher who, um, came in and, and got her and, uh, but it just, it stuck with me. Um, you guys know throughout some of my training, um, so I worked with a lot of um, at-risk youth. At one point in time, I worked in a, a, a girl's home. Um, I worked, I've worked. i worked in two shelters, one for um, basically all ages of kids that were removed from their homes by the state. That was when I lived in Utah. But then when I was in Florida and it was like contracted out, it was um, a teen girl's home. Um, and so one of the the things that I've learned, not just in like my academic studies, but like just from seeing it with these kids that have been struggling, one of the like key factors for resiliency and resiliency, it's that it's so hard to define, right? It's, it's what gives that kid that drive to succeed, to not let trauma define them when bad experiences happen in their life. But there are certain factors that can boost a kid's resiliency. And one of those is having, um, I mean, familial support. So your family support is huge, but having somebody outside of your family, like a mentor, um, just somebody who cares about your success because they care about you as a kid who, you know, they see your potential and they want to help you reach your potential. Right. And this kid didn't have that. And that freaking broke my heart. You know, I've seen, I've seen the struggles that my own daughter has had to deal with because, you know, her dad's active duty military and she's had a high school for every year of high school. Um, and she really hasn't had friends, but she's had support. She's had support and love from her family. Um, you know, she, she's been able to find because she's so good academically. Um, whenever she, you know, does start a new school, like she just like the teachers kind of gravitate towards her because she loves learning. Right. So what about that kid that may not love learning or that kid that may be a little bit obstinate? Like I was, I was that kid, right? I was that kid that, um, didn't have attention, starved for affection or whatever, but, um, I didn't have that adult mentor. Thankfully, I mean, I've turned out the way I am, but, um, but I think about it with the kids and that I've seen with my work. Um, and I don't know where a lot of those kids ended up. I don't, I don't know where they are now. Like if that's, if, 
if they didn't have that support from someone, so they just end up like the cycle repeats itself, right? And then they have children and, and their children lack that, that support and that love. And, um, yeah, so, so this girl, I can't stop thinking about her and how I, I wish, I wish I could have known her like a couple of months before or a year before or whatever, so that I could have shown her that support. And maybe that's the codependent in me because I realize I have a problem. Um, so, so that's, that's one thing that I was thinking about, but it, it coincides with some more thoughts that I've had because you guys know that, um, my population that I, I mean, I love so many different groups of people, but the veteran population, they're my people, right? That's, I was, I was born in a military family and raised in a military family. Um, my husband's military. My son is a disabled veteran. Um, and my, my son's experience is really difficult. And um, there was a lot of hazing. Uh, he was in Fort Wainwright and, um, you know, he, he was medically discharged. Uh, they broke him pretty good, um, both emotionally and physically. And so um, he's been trying to figure out, you know, what to do now that he's out of the military. And one of the really difficult things um, is when you get out of the military, you lose that camaraderie that's so important. And uh, I saw it with the vets that I worked with when I was doing so. I did um, combat trauma and military sexual trauma counseling. And um, one of the great things was like running groups, right? Because then, then they could see that there were other people going through the same struggles that they were. And there were people there that wanted to help catch them when things got tough. And I really, oh my gosh, props out to the, the Vietnam veteran community because you know, they came back to the United States. I mean, first of all, most of them were sent without even wanting to go to fight a war, right? And, and, and talk about classism, right? It was, it was the kids that weren't going to college, right? The, if, if you had, if you had rich parents or I'm not saying that all rich kids dodged the draft because, you know, there were some, some people who stepped up or they believed in it and in the fight and, you know, they did their thing. But, um, you know, it was a lot of these, these kids that would have been blue collar workers, right? They, if they, if they did not intend on going to college, then they were up for the draft and they got sent to Vietnam and all the atrocities that came along with the Vietnam experience. And then they came back and they were spat upon and they were um, demeaned as just like war criminals and just atrocious, which quite frankly, I mean, that, that should have been... <sighs> I don't, I just don't understand why people weren't, you know, sending that, that hate and that, um, that message to the politicians who actually sent these Vietnam vets there. But anyways, sorry. Um, so these Vietnam vets, they come back to the United States and they're very isolated, right? And, and the, the general populace has not treated them kindly. And so they start creating entities to collect one another so that they can support one another. I mean, um, I'm not really sure the history of like the AMVETS and um, American Legions and, um, you know, there's a few other. Uh, there's a lot of vet groups, right? But I think a lot of them, from from what I'm seeing, it seems like a lot of them stem from the Vietnam era. Um, I worked for the Vet Center, um, which is a subset of the VA. Like they kind of took it over, but it was started by Vietnam vets and it was a very, very different counseling experience. And it's kind of sad because it's shifting now that the VA has taken it over. But it was more of like a communal for vets, by vets. Like they try and hire people who have themselves either military experience or like me as a military family or that sort of thing because there's this camaraderie, this community. Um, but, but that's, that's kind of fading away. So you see a lot of these OIF, OEF. Um, so those are your Iraq and your Afghanistan vets. Um, and they, they have like a disconnect with, um, you know, other vets. There's some really cool programs that have started. There's like the red, white, and blue. Um, but I feel like there's still like a lot of isolation that's happening. But then now you've got these younger vets that a lot of them may not have even deployed like my son, but they have traumatic experiences. Um, so they're like, do I, do I fit in? Because I'm like, I mean, how can I even go in and talk about my struggles when there's this Vietnam vet or this Afghanistan vet or, you know, all these people who've experienced so much because 
the, the thing that you'll see about veterans is there's so many that are so selfless, right? They're like, I don't want to take my VA benefits because that takes from somebody else's benefits or I don't really deserve it because look at this guy. Um, but you know, as honorable as that is, it creates some isolation. And, um, I feel like there's a lot of young vets that don't have that mentorship and it goes back so this is where i'm tying it in because i do this <laughs> it goes back to that girl i saw in the bathroom right um resiliency and and does it just have to be kids does it just have to be kids that have somebody in their world that says i believe in you not because you're my blood but because i like you and i see your potential i think that if we can be that for other people in in our adult lives too i mean obviously for children like oh my god our children are the next generation be that for kids like my kid was sick from school one day and the neighbor kids didn't have a ride to school because they missed the bus. Hell yeah, I picked them up and I took them to school. I talked to their mom first, but but it takes a village. And it doesn't just take a village to raise a child. It takes a village as as humans because we are tribal creatures, right? And so uh, I I um, moved to, to this area um, because we've moved three times in the past, past three years. So we were, you know, moving, 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 and it was during COVID and it was really isolating. And, um, you know, we moved here to where we are in Florida last summer. And, um, it's interesting because, you know, post COVID people, I think are a little bit more standoffish anyways. Maybe, maybe it's me, but I had a hard time making friends when we moved here. And then holy crap, all this thing, stuff happened with the U3 halt and, um, you know, my advocacy group or not group advocacy work for economic, um, justice and fair markets. And so I got kind of sucked into that Twitter world and I've, you know, I've made connections there. And I had truly, I know it's weird, but I truly have friends online um, in a community and like a familial relationship built by trauma through, um, you know, all the traumatic experiences that so many retail investors have had. But I was missing that human component, like real life, real in-person people, friends. Um, and this is going to sound so lame, but, uh, you know, like there's this local Amvets here. And my husband and I are probably some of the youngest people, but I didn't realize like all the, the cool things that they do, activism in the community, um, and just trying to, to make their community better and make it a better place for vets. But it's so interesting because like I said, my husband and I are some of the youngest people there. Um, it's, it's something where the younger population is not taking the gauntlet. Like they're not, they're not coming into these, these veteran um, groups that have been built. And yeah, a lot of them are, um, revolved around a bar, but you don't even have to drink. Right. So maybe, maybe there's a better way for a connection, but, um, because you know, substance abuse is a problem, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of supportive people within those eight entities. So I don't, I don't know. Anyways, that's that's a moral dilemma for somebody else to figure out. I just thought it was cool that there was groups like this, but I saw that there was a, like a problem that there were not younger vets coming in. And so what I'm hoping is I'm hoping, I don't know, maybe through the USO, um, which they have one on base um, and they have them at airports. So that's a, a, a group that helps vets too. Maybe combining some of these groups that um, maybe this one, this group has more of an older veteran population. Maybe this one has more of a younger veteran population, but to connect them, to connect these younger vets to these older vets, um, you know, your, um, Gulf vets, your, your Vietnam vets. Cause I mean, we're losing our Vietnam vets. They're, <laughs> they are some of the most amazing people. They're salty ass bastards. Like you have to earn their trust in, I would sit there's one vet that I sat with and he told me a story that he has held inside and it has been beating him up for 50 years. And just to release that and to sit there with him and to be there with him and to not judge him or, um, you know, cause, cause he, he has hate in his heart for himself because of what he was forced to do. Um, but to say, you're not alone. 
and this was a situation that was out of your control and I am here for you. Um, you know, I was a counselor, but, but I think there's something to peer support too, right? So, so yesterday, <laughs> my, uh, my husband and I, our son was in town, our, our oldest, the, um, the vet and uh, we took him to the Ambets, which we now have decided that it's like it's kind of country but but we like it and I've decided I really love karaoke like it's fun and drunk people like the way I sing and so I feel good about myself Um, maybe the more drunk they are the better I sound I don't know <laughs> but uh, we bought our son a lifetime membership to the Ambets because when we took him there there were these these vets, there was one guy, um, I think he maybe is just a little bit older than my husband and I, but they just kind of like took him under their arms and they were teaching him how to play pool because he didn't really know how to play pool. He knows how to play video games. Um, but they, they, they want to like mentor and be there and, and be supportive through struggles and to be friends and to have that camaraderie and he can go anywhere across the nation and he can find people like that. And it just, it warms my heart. And so um, I was thinking about that in context to um, my my advocacy work, right? And online and how it's been such a struggle because we know that there are people who come online who are not necessarily good people. They don't have good intentions, right? They are only there because they hold a short position, oftentimes using counterfeit shorts. A lot of them paid from hedge funds to be there to bring us down, to put doubt, to, to play these mental games that are just so freaking crazy. And then we get paranoid and then we start like, going on witch hunts like who's the hedgy and then we start being cruel to other people in our community and we can't do that we cannot do that and you know i have all these people that are like so and so is doing this and so and so is doing that and uh and i'm like i don't know how to be most effective because if i'm trying to be a referee first of all it's gonna split the community and then i'm less effective you know in my advocacy work and then it eats my soul up but then it eats my soul up too if bad things are happening and i'm not doing something and then i've got some people that i care very 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 deeply for who are like you're complicit if you're not helping and i'm like i'm trying i'm trying to do the best i can and uh you know it, Speaking to that isolation, you know, there's been some really tough times. I know a lot of people have just joined this group from the, since like the U3 halt, right? Since December when, when FINRA halted, um, MMTLP and everyone's money got frozen and it's just been a horrible experience and people have lost their lives and people have lost their homes and people have lost their relationships and their sobriety. And it's been really just a God awful experience, but at the same time, you know, there have been some connections that have been made, but there were these things that happened. I've been in this for two and a half years and there's been people in, and we'll call it this play, um, this torchlight to metamaterials merger to MMTLP trading, all this craziness, right? There's, there's been so many difficult things. Um, and, and I just have my perception of what reality is, but there's like so many dynamics that I probably don't even understand as well at play. But, um, like Smokey, he was my, he's been my rock throughout this entire saga. Let's call it saga. And now he's been struggling and he's doing a lot better now, but I was struggling too. And so I feel like I, I wasn't there for him. Like I should have been there for him. And I feel like there are things that I have done that have failed this community. You know, I got so dark that I was going to, I was like, what do we have to do to get people to listen to help us? I was like, seriously going to do a hunger strike. I mean, in hindsight, it's really stupid because I don't think these bad actors, um, I don't think FINRA or, or the SEC or these brokers or even Congress, like, I, they just lock me up in an institution, right? They they wouldn't understand the passion because passion and craziness kind of <laughs> coincide, right? So those were those were some dark dark days, um, but but I think about it now and I think about what got me through those dark days, and I'm not like out of the woods now because there's still a lot of struggles, but um, 
what's gotten me through and then what was also more difficult for me or what was my undoing and and being engaged in the drama the the infighting trying to referee that it it broke my heart it sucked my soul out and um, that was that's my undoing that's my undoing and so I have to be very cautious because I know I'm not effective but then I also don't want to be viewed as complicit if I'm not engaging that but then also too what has gotten me through is the people who who knew I was in a dark place, the people who loved me no matter, you know, what, because they saw why I was in a dark place because my heart cared so much. Um, those people that, that are mentors and supporting me, those are the people you guys, this is our community. You lifted me up and you carried me through and you've lifted so many other people up and you've carried them through and not everyone's perfect, right? We all act shamefully at times. I've act shamefully many, many times, and there are other people too. And and the grace that has been shown to me, and I know that a lot of people are sick of me saying, show grace, show grace. It takes a lot of strength and humility to put your ego aside, to put all your frustrations aside and say, let's do what's best for us as a group because we are a family. And so speaking of being a family, what I do with my kids when they fight, because I I would find that like one would come to me and say, this one did this. And then the other one would come to me and say, this one did this. And I got to the point where I was like, you know what? If you guys fight, I don't have the energy or the bandwidth to figure out exactly what happened and, and who was wrong. Because I'm already sucking enough of my energy from for myself personally, but for my family in this fight, this takes so much from them and and you know everyone's like thank you for your time and I'm and I'm I'm grateful to give that because you know I I believe in it and my family believes in me but but they see that this has taken time from mom um and so so what I do with my kids is I just say you know I don't know who started it but basically I'm disappointed in both of you because you're not able to work it out um if someone is treating you unkindly, if it's not a safety risk, like if it's a safety risk, then obviously elevate it, um, report it to Twitter. Um, but it's okay for not everybody to have to engage. And I appreciate one person in particular because she she's like, no, you know, you do you do your stuff. I'll I'll handle it on my own. But um, maybe maybe just not engage, or or just yeah just just not engage those people because there's almost a high that some people get from fighting um, and it's not necessarily that that anybody knows and I'm not targeting anyone this is just from my my academic you're getting some um, psychoeducation this is psychoeducation and I'm not your counselor and this is not financial advice yeah um there are endorphins that people get when they fight and, and I think that people are so starved for engagement and attention that sometimes even negative attention and engagement, um, it, it gets you that level of endorphins that's almost addicting, right? So there's an, addic an addictive component to social media that we need to be very mindful of. And the fighting is just an amped up version of that, right? Um, you know, people... People are on social media for, for different reasons, but I truly believe that there are many of us that are really good in the community, but it's kind of hard to shut it off. I know for me, social media absolutely can be an addiction and, and not just social media, this fight that we are in to make a better country, this fight that we are in because we see corruption and we want to right wrongs. Um, but sometimes doing less is doing more. So, so stepping away, like we don't have to be in that fight. We can step out of it. And if you, if you don't give power to that person's voice, if you step away from it, then that's kind of a, it's, it's really cool because if we're like a family group, right? We're like the safe bubble, right? Where we can try and show each other a little bit more grace because we understand each other a little bit better than the rest of the world. We know the trauma we've experienced. We know why emotions are high. Um, and it's a way to just kind of, I don't want to say educate because that sounds harsh, but, but 
but help people understand the dynamics and how we can interact in social media because social media has become this place where people just go that they think they're anonymous and they can just be mean. But what if we can make it something different? And I truly believe that there's something so special, not just, um, well, I mean the retail community, but really the MMTLP community. And I'm sorry, I love a lot of my GTII folks and, um, you know, the BBIG folks, because there's a lot of really good people there, but there's just something so special about the community and MMTLP and the fight that we're in together and the love that we show one another because we know that we're struggling and it's just been such a unique situation. And so I would like to um, see if maybe, maybe this might be helpful in the community. So we know that positive reinforcement works so much better than negative reinforcement, right? So when you see the things that you like, take the time to to support those people and to say thank you and and to be positive and to be that positive person in the community right do positive things show show the community the behavior that you want to see out of them i mean i know it's like maybe an overused quote um, to be the change but be the change be the change because when you use negative reinforcement um it's not as effective. So like calling people out, I mean, absolutely there's safety stuff, but maybe do it. Um, if it's not an immediate safety risk, do it on the back end. Just make your statement like, you know, the I feels, oh my gosh, guys, I feel statements instead of you statements. When you use you statements, it puts people on guard. So maybe focus on how you feel because nobody can argue with the way you feel like when that happened, I felt blah, 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 blah. So those, those are really cool things that you can do just to kind of like uh, disarm, disarm. We're going to get these disarming tactics, guys. We don't always have to be a vigilante on, on Twitter. Like, you know, maybe give people um, advice on what, what you might like to see in the future. In the future, I might like to see this. But, but man, when you see that person, maybe there was somebody that like kind of gets on your skin, right? And, and you see things all the time and you're like, Ugh. but then you see something that they do and it's good. Call out the good. We have to own the good. Um, and I think that that can make us better. If we can support one another, if, if, I mean, I, we're grown ass adults, right? But I truly believe just like that girl needed her family there with her. They, she wanted someone to support her as she walked across that stage. I want to be that person for the people in our community. I want you guys to help me cheer someone who's been struggling, who's doing good, who's walking across that stage because, damn it, they did something good. And I want to support that. And that's who we can be in the community. I don't want you guys to feel alone. I don't. Because we're not. We're in this together. Um, and so those are just some of the thoughts that I've had. I know I, I do a lot of ramblings and rantings. But when you see me, and maybe I'm choosing not to get involved in, in, in dramatics or... And I hate to use the word drama because I feel like that, that minimizes the, the, the pain that someone else is feeling when they're engaging in those interactions. But... But that's, that's not something that I need to be involved with. But I will support you and love on you. I shouldn't use that term. Um, that's like a Southern thing. It's like a Southern prayer thing, by the way. So I'm starting to pick up all these like nuances. But um, I, I want to support you. Um, and I don't want to have to correct you. If I have to have to, damn it, just don't make me have to have to. Because I don't like doing negative reinforcement. Let me see your good. Let me lift you up. That's what we want to do. And that's what we can do. And we may have different ideas of how to get things done. Because I know a lot of people disagree with the way I'm doing things. But you know what? Maybe let's start supporting one another a little bit better. And I can start with me. Because I'm not perfect. So I'm going to make that commitment. And then I'm going to try and be more positive. I'm going to try and lift people up. And I'm trying to show more gratitude. And I'm hoping that you guys can do that with me. Because I think that, that we can be stronger. And we can make this process less traumatic. Because it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while, guys. Um, unless it doesn't. If it doesn't, that's amazing. Um, but either way, we're in it together. And there's a lot of good that we can do. But it's much better if we can do it together. Thanks.